Hi everybody, Mrs. Singerly here, and today we're going to be talking about cells. Um, cells are really neat. Um, you see them on the screen. We have some dividing. Um, we have a little kind of diatom that when agitated can bioluminesce, which is really neat. And cells a lot of times are really understood, and a lot of times people think that they're boring, but they're not boring. I mean, if you look at your hand, you can't see the cells that are there, but with the microscope, you can. So the microscope opened this whole new world to scientists. Things that were invisible before are now things that we can actually see. We can see microscopic organisms in the water, um, like the amoeba here, or like the paramecium. Um, we can look into cells and see what's going on. One of my favorites that we'll talk about in this unit is the cytoskeleton. Um, it's kind of like a monorail within the cell where these motor proteins can walk along on this cytoskeleton, which is really neat. Um, and we've developed over the years more powerful microscopes to increase magnification, um, like with the electron microscope, which is something we'll talk about in our microscopes unit. So first, I want to lead you through how cells were discovered, even though you may not be directly tested on these scientists, you may see them referenced in test or quiz questions, um, and it gives you a good idea of how they built what we're going to learn about the cell theory. So the invention of the microscope was really important. And as the technology improved, so did scientists' ability to understand the world um, within cells and what those cells were doing. And one of the first people to do that was Robert Hooke. Um, he was the first about plant tissue under a microscope. And what he put under the microscope was slices of cork from an oak tree. And if you can think of a tree, the cork layer is going to be kind of right underneath that bark layer and it's a dead layer of cells. And so when you put these under the microscope, all that's left was the cell wall. The insides had disintegrated and it reminded him of tiny rooms or cells. And in Latin, little rooms um, is cellulae. And so um, when monks used to, you know, be cloistered in monasteries, they used to stay in the cellulae in these tiny rooms. And that's what these, these cells reminded, of, reminded him of, and that's how they got their name. The next scientist is Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Um, he was the first to see living organisms under the microscopes. And you know, he took pond water, you know, puddles of rainwater from the streets. He took scrapings off of his teeth and his mind was blown away when he looked under the microscope and he saw all of this stuff swimming around. Now, of course, this is in the 1680s. So he didn't say, OMG, there's little animals swimming around. He described them as we animacules, or basically small living creatures that he found in the rainwater. And he discovered things like bacteria. Those are from like the scrapings of his teeth, um, protists, sperm cells, blood cells, nematodes, rotifers, which are really cool, which is this little organism right here, um, and much, much more. Um, this organism down here that kind of looks like a tiny octopus is known as a hydra. And we'll see the hydra again when we talk about asexual reproduction. Um, and you can see here, these are his drawings. And that's one of the things that we'll learn as we talk about cells and microscopes is how important making accurate drawings through observations as it and we'll practice with that when we learn about our microscopes. Now we're going to jump from you know we're in the 1680s we're jumping to the 1830s and of course research with microscopes and cells still continued but in the early 1800s we saw a lot of innovation right because we have the industrial revolution and so we're getting more advanced technology we have more people studying cells and they're able to do things like robert brown discover and name the nucleus matthias schleiden who concluded that all plants are made out of cells how did they make that conclusion they looked at lots and lots and lots and lots of plants 
Same thing with Theodore Schwann concluded that all animals are made of cells. They did that by sampling hundreds of thousands of different animals and finding that cells are the basic unit that makes up those organisms. And in the 1850s, Rudolf Virchow was able to actually see cell division happening and was able to conclude that new cells are produced from pre-existing cells. And when we take all of these observations and all of these experiments over centuries, it leads to the development of a cell theory. So one of the most important things that I want you to remember is theory is not a bad word, okay? Theory is good. It means it's earned a gold star. It means it's been backed up by oodles and oodles and oodles of evidence from many different scientists. And we're combining all of that information to put it into a theory. Now, why don't we call it a fact? Well, theories are going to include facts. It can include laws. It includes observations. It's going to include all of this stuff. The reason why we use the word theory is because we're using it to explain something about the natural world. So that is why it is called a theory. So what are the three tenets of the cell theory? This is something that you're going to want to have memorized. Number one, that all living things are made out of one or more cells. Number two, cells are the basic unit of structure and function in living things. And three, all cells come from pre-existing cells. So those are our three tenets of the cell theory. And like I said, that's something you're gonna wanna have memorized. Now we do have some exceptions to the cell theory. And one big one is viruses. Viruses are not considered alive and they're not considered a cell. And the reason why is they cannot reproduce on their own and they don't perform the life functions. So when you think of things that are alive, they're taking molecules in, they're excreting molecules out, they're synthesizing molecules within um, their cells, um, they're transporting, which means they're absorbing and circulating things around their body. Um, they reproduce on their own. Um, they maintain homeostasis. They respond to stimuli. And these are things that viruses just can't do. Now, the virus that you're seeing on your screen, this is kind of the iconic virus. Um, it looks kind of like the Mars rover that they put on Mars. And it's a bacteriophage. And so this happens to be a virus that attacks bacteria. And in fact, um, many of the viruses that are in our world are viruses that specifically attack um, bacteria. In the top right of your screen, you see lysis. So remember in our biochemistry unit, we learned about hydrolysis. It's the same word ending. And lysis means to break or split. And so one of the things that viruses will do is they will um, kind of commandeer the cell and turn it into a virus making factory. And then the cell will lyse, it will break or split apart. And the viruses will be released out into the environment or out into the bloodstream where they can go and infect other cells. So let's talk about the structure of a virus because viruses are all over the news right now. Viruses are extremely small. So we're talking nanometers. Nanometers are a billionth of a meter. They are small, small, small. They're 50 times smaller than a bacteria. They contain some genetic material and that genetic material can be DNA or RNA. And they have what's called a capsid. It's a protective coat of protein. So that is something that all of the viruses are gonna have. They're gonna be really small, they're gonna contain some genetic material, and they're gonna have this capsid, this protective layer of protein. Now, some viruses are, in addition to that, gonna have an envelope, and it's made out of a lipid membrane. So this is something that's found on some viruses, but not all. And where they're getting that lipid membrane from, they're getting it from the host cells. They're getting it from whatever cell they're infected. They're kind of stealing some of their um, cell membrane. And a lot of times on, if they have that, this envelope, this membrane, they'll have proteins on the outside of it that'll help the viral, viral particles bind to the host cells. 
And so viruses, they were discovered in 1852 when some diseases were found to pass through even the finest filters. And that's why, you know, we've been hearing a lot about COVID and it's important to wear a mask and what kind of masks are good and what kind of masks aren't and why doctors and nurses are wearing the N95s or the N99s is we need a filter that can filter out very, very small particles. And so how does a virus work? A virus is parasitic. And basically what it's doing is it's commandeering the host cell and using its resources to make more viruses. So basically when it commandeers the host cell, it's reprogramming that cell to become a little virus factory. And what you're seeing on the animations on, on the screen is the virus is entering the host cell. Once it gains entry into the host cell, it's gonna use that host cell's machinery to make pieces of the virus that then can be reassembled into a new virus. And then that is like lysed out of the cell. And you can see that kind of happening in this animation where it's leaving. And so the virus isn't reproducing on its own, it's using another cell to do that for it. And because viruses are all over the news, I do want to talk about the coronavirus, which is the, the technical name for it is SARS-CoV-2. And it's an RNA-based virus. So that means that the genetic material that's in the COVID virus is RNA. It has that capsid, the protein coat, and then it has that, you know, additional envelope, which is made out of a lipid, pro, like a lipid membrane and it has these spike proteins that are on it. And those spike proteins are how the coronavirus gets its name um, because corona is Latin for crown. And here we can see some electron microscope images of the coronavirus. Here's kind of like a, like a 3D kind of version of what that might look like. And those spikes kind of give it that crown. And that's how it's getting its name and important because those spikes are what is allowing the virus to dock to the host cells and to infect them. And so I've got two videos that do a good job of showing how the virus, um, it, what makes it up and then how it infects our cells. So we're gonna watch these right now. Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses, some of which infect humans. The coronavirus at the root of COVID-19 is the newest known member of this family. And like other coronaviruses that infect people, the new coronavirus causes respiratory disease, among other symptoms. At their core, coronaviruses contain a genetic blueprint called RNA, similar to DNA. The single-stranded RNA acts as a molecular message that enables production of proteins needed for other elements of the virus. Bound to this string of RNA are nuclear proteins, proteins that help give the virus its structure and enable it to replicate. Encapsulating the RNA genome is the viral envelope, which protects the virus when it is outside of a host cell. This outer envelope is made from a layer of lipids, a waxy barrier containing fat molecules. As well as protecting the precious genetic cargo, this layer anchors the different structural proteins needed by the virus to infect cells. Envelope proteins embedded in this layer aid the assembly of new virus particles once it has infected a cell. The bulbous projections seen on the outside of the coronavirus are spike proteins. This fringe of proteins gives the virus its crown or halo-like appearance under the microscope from which the Latin name corona is derived. The spike proteins act as grappling hooks that allow the virus to latch onto host cells and crack them open for infection like all viruses, coronaviruses are unable to thrive and reproduce outside of a living host. All right. And let's see if you'll let me go to the next slide here. All right, here we go. This is how it infects the cell. Due to its unique features, the novel coronavirus is particularly good at infecting new cells. 
both in the upper respiratory tract as well as deeper down in the lungs. Here's a look at how the process takes place. The microscopic virus enters through the nose or mouth where it begins its infection of our airways. The outer spike protein of the coronavirus latches onto specific receptors on the surface of cells in our respiratory tract. In the case of COVID-19, the virus latches on to the ACE2 receptor. This binding triggers the process by which the virus fuses into human cells. The viral envelope merges with the oily membrane of our own cells, allowing the virus to release its genetic material into the inside of the healthy cell. The genetic blueprint of the virus is RNA instead of DNA, which acts as a molecular message, instructing our host cell machinery to read the template and translate it into proteins that make up new virus particles. The hijacking persists. As the human host cell continues to generate more copies of the virus, assemble these copies into viable particles and traffic them to the outer edges of the cell for release. Each infected cell may produce and release millions of copies of the virus, which can then go on to infect other neighboring cells, as well as neighboring people when they are expelled from the airways in droplets via coughing and sneezing. Okay, so I know that those videos are oversimplified, but it gives you a really good idea of the structure of the COVID virus and, the, and how it actually infects our cells. All right, let's see if I can get on to the next slide. Here we go. Okay, so the reason why we're talking about viruses is that they're exceptions to the cell theory. And we do have some other exceptions to the cell theory as well, such as mitochondria and chloroplasts. Um, they are not cells, and we're going to learn that um, kind of the evolution of mitochondria and chloroplasts later on in this presentation, um, but they do have their own DNA, and they can reproduce um, on their own, um, but we do not consider them cells, and again, we're going to learn more about that when we um, talk more about their structure later on in this presentation. And then, of course, the first cells. Um, we don't know how the first cells came about. We do have a lots of hypotheses that we've tested with experience, um, experiments. Um, scientists have evidence that they uh, can possibly arise from a non-cellular material. But unfortunately, we don't have a time machine. We can't go back and see where the first cells came from. But we do know that once there are cells, cells can reproduce. That's how we know that cells come from pre-existing cells. So next let's talk about the general characteristics of cells. All life functions are carried on by cells and what are multicellular many-celled organisms, cells are specialized. Specialized means that they might look different, act different, and they're going to carry on different jobs. Um, and it says in other words, one organism is going to contain many different kinds of cells which work together to allow organisms to perform many activities. And over on the right, you see some different cell types. And the first two show you red blood cells and muscle cells that are going to be found in humans. And we can see how they look different and they're doing a different function. And what's interesting is that all of our cells in our body have an identical copy of DNA. Um, but by choosing which directions they follow, um, they can, I shouldn't say choose because that's simplified, but, um, but they're kind of designated a job and by utilizing different chunks of the DNA um, that allows them to perform these different roles and look and act differently. And so our red blood cells are really gonna be important in transporting oxygen through our bodies. Muscle cells are important because they move parts of an organism. And multicellular organisms aren't just animals, they can be plants too. And so one of our units later, we're going to look at transport throughout plants. And so plants are going to have different cells that perform different functions. We have some that are going to act as like a dermal layer, some that are going to act for doing photosynthesis and support, and some like xylem and phloem cells that are responsible for transport throughout a plant. One big thing I want you to know next, and this is the last bullet on the slide, is what structures are found in all cells. So it doesn't matter if you're a bacteria, if you're a plant, if you're an animal, if you're an amoeba, if you're a portobello mushroom, it doesn't matter who you are, you're surrounded by a cell membrane. You're going to have a cell membrane, you're going to have this watery, goopy material called cytoplasm, 
you're going to have genetic material in the form of DNA, and you're going to have ribosomes. And so those are going to be the four things that we're going to be that are going to be found in kind of all cells. They're going to have cell membrane, cytoplasm, genetic material, and ribosomes. When we look at unicellular organisms, unicellular like a unicycle means one cell, and for unicellular organisms, that one cell can carry out all of the life functions. And I have examples of some unicellular organisms here. We have organisms like an amoeba, um, a bacteria, algae, and even yeast is unicellular. And the, they are able to carry on all of the life functions as one cell. In a multicellular organism, it's gonna be a little bit different because we are made up of many cells which have to work together to perform the life functions of an organism. And we as humans, we're made up of over 60 trillion cells and our cells are organized into tissues, organs, organ systems, and organisms. And so a tissue is a group of cells working together. A group of cells that have common structure and function is gonna make up of tissue. If we put a bunch of tissues working together, we get an organ. So that'd be like the stomach, the heart, the brain. If we put a bunch of organs together, we get an organ system. So think circulatory system, nervous system, reproductive system. And if we put a bunch of organ systems together, we get a whole organism. So let's take a look at an example of this. Um, we're going to start off with a cell, right? If we put a bunch of cells that are similar in structure and function and they're working together, they're going to make up a tissue. And an example of a tissue in humans might be, say, like epithelial tissue, okay? If we put the epithelial tissue together with muscle tissue, um, nervous tissue, connective tissue, we might get an organ like the small intestine. If we put the small intestine together with the large intestine, with the liver, with the pancreas and the stomach, we would get an organ system like the digestive system. And then if we put all of our systems together, like the digestive system, with the circulatory system, with the respiratory system, with the nervous system, with the endocrine system, we would get like a whole organism. Okay. The last thing we're going to talk about today is the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So when we look, when scientists look at cells, they divide the cells up into two categories, prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells, they're small and, and simple. A lot of times when we're measuring cells, we're always measuring on that micrometer, like micrometer scale. Um, so prokaryotes are small. They're one to five micrometers. They have no nucleus. They have 70 S ribosomes. They have a cell wall made out of peptidoglycan. They have no membrane bound organelles. They have a single circular chromosome and our only example is a bacteria. So the way I remember this is pro rhymes with no. So prokaryotes have no nucleus. They have no membrane bound organelles. Okay, and they are the really small and simple, right? Our only example is a bacteria. And if you look at the top right, it says pro means before, carrion means nucleus. So these are organisms that evolved before the nucleus. And so scientists, we have fossil evidence showing us that prokaryotes were some of the first living organisms on our planet. So pro rhymes with no, no nucleus, no membrane-bound organelle. They're really small and simple. Now, other things that I want you to know, because we think about all the living things on the planet, the only things that are prokaryotic are bacteria. So I think strep throat bacteria, E. coli bacteria, salmonella bacteria, cyanobacteria, it's got bacteria. So the only thing that is in this group. And so bacteria, their DNA, it's not the iconic chromosome that we think of, it's a small circular loop of DNA and it's not housed in a nucleus, all right? They also are gonna have ribosomes, but they have a particular kind of ribosome known as a 70S ribosome. Now, the S just stands, it has to do with the sediment, sedimentary rate, like how it, it 
sediments out when they when they process and look at the material. That's what the S stands for. Um, but you just need to know that prokaryotes they have 70 S ribosomes, and their cell wall is made out of a substance known as peptidoglycan. It's a fun word to say, peptidoglycan. So next, let's take a look at eukaryotic cells. U rhymes with do. You rhymes with do. These are going to be larger and much more complex than prokaryotes. They do have a nucleus. They do have membrane-bound organelles. Their ribosomes are going to be a type of ribosome known as 80S ribosomes. And this is going to be the iconic chromosomes that you've seen. Of. They're these linear chromosomes that are made up out of DNA, and they're going to be what you've seen growing up in movies and TV shows and in your science classes in elementary and in middle school. Now, this is going to be everything else. So every living thing on the planet, except for bacteria, is going to be eukaryotic. So we have eukaryotic cells because we are animals as humans. Um, plants are going to have eukaryotic cells. Fungi um, like yeast and portobello mushrooms that you put on your pizza, they're eukaryotic cells. And protists, protists are going to be organisms like that paramecium or the amoeba. They're going to have eukaryotic cells as well. So if we look at a picture, I want you to see the size difference. Right on the right is going to be a eukaryotic cell, like an animal cell, like our cells. Look how much larger they are than the bacteria. The bacteria are a thousand times smaller. Okay, so they're a lot smaller. And you can notice all of these, what they call membrane bound organelles, in the cell that the prokaryotes do not have. So this is a little animation, it goes through things that they have in common from the amoeba sisters. You know I love the amoeba sisters. And then it has what is different. So let's, if we go over through the animation again, what do they have in common? They have cell membrane in common. They have DNA in common. They have ribosomes. They, but they do not have membrane bound organelles and they do not have a nucleus. And we can remember pro rhymes with no and new rhymes with do. So we're going to go through this test yourself section together. Um, a cell is examined and has a cell membrane. Well, all cells have a cell membrane, so that's going to be all cells. Number two, a bacteria cell is observed under the microscope. Hmm, think about for the second, a bacteria cell, which one would that be? Prokaryotic. Good. It is found that a cell has genetic material in the form of DNA. Good, that's all cells. Number four, a sea grape tree has this kind of cell. So a tree, good, that's eukaryotic, right? Because everything is eukaryotic except bacteria. Number five, a cell is observed under the microscope and has a nucleus. It does have a nucleus, so U rhymes with do. Number six, a cell is found to have a single circular chromosome. That's going to belong to the bacteria, right? And bacteria are prokaryotic. A scientist finds 80S ribosomes in a cell. So 80S ribosomes, which group did that belong with? Pro or you? Eukaryotic, good. Cytoplasm is found in these kinds of cells. That's all cells. All cells are going to have that, the goop in the cell. Number nine, an elephant has these kinds of cells. That's an an animal, right? So that's going to be eukaryotic. And lastly, number 10, membrane-bound organelles like Golgi bodies and vacuoles are absent. So it means they don't have them. Good. Prokaryotic. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. So you'll notice that as we kind of go through the rest of our notes and the rest of our cell, um, cell lecture, we are going to be primarily focused on eukaryotic cells that have these membrane bound organelles. Um, and organelles are structures within a cell that perform a specific job. So why do eukaryotes have these organelles? Why are they important? It's important for a concept called compartmentalization. 
what this compartmentalization does is it creates different local environments. It separates pH, maybe separates constant, different concentrations of materials. And that is important because it allows the cells to function efficiently, right? They, they can be more complex. They're better able to maintain homeostasis. They're better able to perform specific jobs. They're not wasting energy and they're not wasting resources. So having these compartments is really important for eukaryotic cells to function efficiently. Um, I kind of equate it to if you think of your house, right? And you have bedrooms and you have bathrooms and you have kitchens and you have living rooms and you have dining rooms you have all of these different compartments in your house it allows your house and your family to function efficiently think about if your entire family was cooking and going to the bathroom in the same room and sleeping in the same room it wouldn't function efficiently and so that's what these compartments are doing and well, what do they have to do? Why do they have to function efficiently? Cells are really busy. Um, it's like a whole little city inside. They have to do things like make proteins. Proteins control almost every cell function, not to mention they make up a whole bunch of structures. They have to make energy, which is needed for daily life and growth. And they have to be able to make more cells. That's how we grow and develop. It's how we repair you know, worn out cell parts or worn out parts of our body. Um, and some cells will go through like a renewal process as well. And so what you see at the bottom of your screen is an animal cell and at the right is a plant cell. Okay, and that is where we are going to stop for today. Next lesson, we'll be going into all of the different structures within this, the eukaryotic cells. All right, I hope that.